So the form is fundamental. And the electron responds with this form. I don't know if you meant to say to this form, but the electron has a response. It responds with the form, which communicates to other electrons, and to the form, which communicates from other electrons. So it's all the same thing, really. It's very, very different from the current interpretation, which is that sometimes it's a wave and sometimes it's a particle. It depends on how you measure it and what your perception is. Now this even explains superconductivity. The electrons, he says, quote, moving by a common pool of information, end quote. So uh, this, if the field is allowed to carry information regardless of its distance, uh, and the intensity of the information will be the same, then this uh, non-local interaction called entanglement and all this stuff is all done. It's solved. It's solved. Then the interviewer says, so you're saying that the physical universe is more about information than about substance, because this interaction of the form taking things and not just the mechanistic view is, is so prevalent in the universe. And he says, no, I'm saying that it is both. It is both information driven and mechanistically driven. So this guy is pretty good, isn't he? He's, he's great. He says, I'm not going to, you know, cut one part off and just say this is everything, and I'm not going to cut that part off and say that's everything. Reality is an integrated whole. It has many subtle parts we have to figure out. Now the questioner asks Bohm, what would uh, Niels Bohr think of this if you told him? Bohm says, I'm not sure. And then so the questioner says, well, you've, you're giving this view of a field that doesn't decrease with distance. It's the same all the way through. And what would, what would his reaction to that exact detail of your theory be? And Bohm says, Niels Bohr would say there's no way to discuss this at, at all. Niels Bohr would say there's nothing but a phenomenon, which is a whole thing. It's an indivisible whole. So Niels Bohr would say uh, you can't uh, analyze it any further. The system is a whole uh, which you, uh, into which you cannot peer. You can't get any more information. When you do try to get information, of course, you have an effect on it. To the extent you can say anything about this whole, according to Niels Bohr, the only thing you can really say is mathematically you can say that it's probable or that in our past experience it has been and therefore this is all we can say. It is probable. So that's all that he would give us the mathematical description of the probabilities of what might happen and Bohm's idea of discussing this as a field that doesn't drop off with distance how could we ever know that? That's meaningless. All we can do is give the mathematical descriptions. M meaningless according to Niels Bohr. And right at the end of number three of five, the interviewer says, so what you're doing is you're, you're giving a uh, non-popularistic view of quantum mechanics that goes against the mainstream. And Niels Bohr, or pardon me, David Bohm says, uh, yes, that's right. And the interviewer says, so Niels Bohr and other physicists would disagree with your interpretation of certain small-scale phenomenon and stuff, and they say that you're opening a conversation you cannot even have. You can't even open this conversation. Um, that's what they're saying. You can't even... Niels Bohr says you can't even have this conversation. Why would you ever try to put forward a theory like that? You could never know these things. Right? You can never know reality as a whole. You can only know the individual parts you measure and then you're not even sure if they're going to be the same tomorrow. Now, David Bohm accepts uh, Aristotelian logic and the, the fundamental reality of reality, and Niels Bohr is a Kantian. I think that's obvious. And then Bohm says, yeah, I'm not sure why he would disagree with me, because he says, quote, Niels Bohr's discussion is very subtle, conversation is very subtle, and it's very hard to pin him down. End quote. Does Niels Bohr sound like a Kantian to you? And David Bohm sounds like the type of person who always wants you to say, now, what, will you explain that? What do you mean? Yeah, I'm not going to let you off the hook. You need to ex explain what you mean there. And Niels Bohr is the type of person who will just throw out shit and uh, people are dazzled by the meaninglessness of it. And then he uses, um, like... Uh, for um, for things that contradict each other, if there's this thing has to be true in the model and that thing has to be true and they can't both be true, he calls them complementary truths, right? So go ahead and get into Niels Bohr, you know. And David Bohm says that 
Niels Bohr would regard this as as, um, as something that's not tied David Bohm's theory, he would regard it as something that's not tied to an experimental fact. Um, and it seems that all of the experimental facts actually do point to David Bohm's idea that there's a, a field that doesn't weaken with distance, um, that is not affected by physical distance. The form is the function of the field, not the mechanistic nature of the field. It seems like the experimental facts do say that, but you can, ex you can look at the experimental facts in any way you want. And Niels Bohr has come at this situation with philosophy in his back pocket. We all know that philosophy comes before physics, don't we? And Niels Bohr has come with philosophy in his back pocket. He thinks he has come free of philosophy because he has philosophers who have fooled him. He thinks he comes to this physical question free of philosophy and then interprets uh, reality and doesn't, he says, I, I'm not going to go, you know, there's no indication that there's a field. All we know is that this particle and that particle did the same thing at the same time. That's all we know. Right? So David Bohm's in favor of induction. David Bohm thinks that you can take information and come to a conclusion that's true for the whole universe, just like uh, Newton did with gravity and uh, Benjamin Franklin did with lightning. We don't have to investigate lightning on Mars. We know that lightning has a certain nature. We don't have to go investigate it in Thailand and Australia. It's the same there as it was in, in uh, Pennsylvania when Franklin did his thing. And Bohm says we can get to that. We can say something about the whole. And Niels Bohr says you have no experimental facts to show that your statement about the whole is true, where actually all the experimental facts do show that, but Niels uh, Bohr is not open to that because he's got so much philosophy stuffed in his back pocket, saying, like David Hume says, the sun rose today, but that's not going to tell us anything about tomorrow. Wrong. It actually means that the sun's going to come up tomorrow. That unless you have a reason to question what you know, you have to shut up. You cannot question whether or not the sun's going to come up tomorrow if it comes up every day. That, right, you might need to look into the cause of why the sun keeps coming up and it's that the earth rotates. But that doesn't mean just because you don't know the cause that reality is going to cave into your ignorance and not have the sun come up tomorrow. The sun's going to come up tomorrow whether you like it or not and whether you say you know it or not. So you can investigate re reality if you want, but not according to Niels Bohr. David Bohm says we can know if the sun's going to come up. He says we, we can know if there's a field that doesn't weaken with distance that informs electrons. Bohr says we can't know that. There's no experimental evidence that could ever show that. Now the questioner says, in your experimental predictions, there's no difference between you and Niels Bohr. You both predict the exact same things. And Bohm says, that's right, there's, there's no difference. No difference. We're both predicting the exact same experimental results, but um, David Bohm wants to look at it as a situation that we can know, a situation in which everything in the situation is real, and in which all of it can be uh, figured out. And Niels Bohr wants to look at it as a situation that we create when we go to it, a dynamic process in which we can never be an objective observing party, uh, and so on. So they have the exact same experimental results. Now this reminds me very much of Copernicus and the ancient uh, Ptolemaic system, Ptolemaic system. And you have Ptolemy giving better, accurate, more accurate predictions of when the sun's going to come up and where and which stars and constellations and the moon and whatever. Better, uh, uh, more accurate, more reality true predictions than Copernicus, who says the sun is standing still. So sailors and stuff, people continue to use the more accurate predictions, even though the central theory behind them was false. So this might tell you that no matter how accurate Niels Bohr is, and no matter, you know, quantum mechanics is so accurate that they can, uh, uh, Richard Feynman said it's like predicting the width of the United States to within a, the width of your finger or something like that, and being, being accurate. And that's fine. Ptolemy was very, very accurate. It's just that his theory wasn't true. And here's this whole crowd of people who says, your theory never can be true. We can never even know reality. My theory is good because it has good results. We can actually test it. And I have good results. 